Stephanie Müller and I presenting fabrication, which is work I did with Tobias Moore, Kerstin Günther at Johannes Kornbogen, and my advisor Patrick Bornisch at the Hanover Institute. So our work is motivated by the fact that 3D printing is very slow. So for instance, in the case of this head-mounted display body here, 3D printing takes more than 14 hours. So you may say that this is not a big deal and that you can just print overnight by your TV. But let me tell you, it is actually a big deal. Because printing overnight limits the, uh, limits the design workflow to only one iteration per day. And as a result, when you're iterating over a design, it may take several days, although the actual design work was probably only a couple of minutes. So our goal with this project was to speed up um, iterations to allow for multiple iterations in a day. So resulting in a better design in less time. Our idea is to limit 3D printing to where it is actually necessary. So we replace the entire 3D model with Lego bricks and we use 3D printing only where it's actually necessary and where the high resolution of the 3D printer is required. So here for the head mounted display body, the only thing that really matters is to get the lenses at the correct distance to the display because otherwise the image will blur. So we therefore only print the lens mounts and we build the rest from Lego bricks. So using our approach, we have a first version of our prototype in only around one hour, which is a speed up of a factor of 13. Of course, our approach requires us to spend some time playing around with Lego bricks while the 3D printer is printing. The cool thing about our approach is that it's inherently modular. So if we want to later on replace some parts, we can just quickly take off some bricks and put in the newly printed part. We call the overall concept behind our approach low fi fabrication. And in contrast to the traditional workflow in which the 3D model is always fabricated at high fidelity, low fi fabrication actually means that all intermediate versions are printed as fast low fidelity previews. And only at the very, very end when the design is finished, we actually print a complete model. So let me show you some projects from a related area, which is low-fi prototyping. So low-fi prototyping methods such as paper prototyping are great because they save time and they save money. And recently the concept of low-fi prototyping has also been applied to prototyping physical interfaces. So MIDAS, for instance, allows designers to quickly create capacitive touch layouts for interactive prototypes. Sauron follows a similar goal. It uses a single camera to detect user input instead of wiring up all these electronic component, components, which also takes a substantial time. So lo-fi prototyping, as I said, is great because users can quickly test the main concept with a simple representation. However, since the prototype itself is low fidelity, it takes extra work to convert it to a high fidelity version at the end. So in contrast with low fi fabrication, we propose to use a high fidelity model, but to fabricate it at low fidelity during design iteration and only at the very end when we want to have the final version that makes the transition much faster. So we also built a first, sys uh, a first system that allows for low fi fabrication by combining bricks and 3D printing, and I will show you our system in the next couple of minutes. So as an example, I will use the head-mounted display body I already showed you in the introduction. And as I said, the goal here is to get the lenses at the correct uh, distance to the display because otherwise the image will blow. So here we already loaded the 3D model into our software, and in the next step we will convert it uh, to bricks by using the Lego Fi and then the layout button. So basically, here I'm already done in some, way, in some ways, but I still need to mark up the lens mounts for 3D printing. So here we use the split brush to split up the region around the lens mount. And now we use the high resolution brush for marking the regions for 3D printing. 
we now use the merge brush to merge the 3D printed part into the surrounding label assembly. And then we use the same merge brush to merge the remaining labels again. And since we have two lens mods, we repeat the process on the other side. Now we can simply export the two lens parts as 3D printable STL files and load them into the 3D printing software of our 3D printer. And while the 3D printer is printing, we can basically already start assembling. So here you see Cassie, my co-author, and she's assembling right now, and the next bricks are highlighted in blue. And when the printed lens parts are ready, we can just simply insert them in the assembly. So this iteration took only around one hour compared to the 13 hours, uh, 14 hours uh, for complete 3D printing, which is a speed up of a factor of 13. So in this case, we were lucky and the lenses were great right away. So we decided to design the next aspect here. So we now want to iterate on the forehead shape and try different versions. And as I said, since fabrication is very modular, you can just take off some parts and click in the new <coughs> Replacing all these different parts here took only around three hours. So after testing again, we noticed that the barrier between the two eyes is too small. So the barrier prevents the left eye from seeing what the right eye sees. So we therefore go back to the 3D model and iterate on the barrier. So we can reload the 3D model into a CAD editor and make it larger. Now, when we load the model back into our fabrication software, our fabrication software actually displays which parts change, as you can see here in red. Now we can simply mark up the region again and replace the part. So replacing the part here only took around 30 minutes. So if you take all these iterations together, it took us only around five hours to try different designs. So if you think about it, using the traditional printing approach, this design process would have stretched out over several days, and we can now do this in one day. So we're now happy with our designs. We do a full, complete 3D print at the end, which basically closes the um, low pi fabrication cycle. So obviously this is a technical paper, so the main metric here is speed and not user interaction. So in the next section, I just show you how fast you can actually get. So on the left side, you can see the 3D printing time for the head mounted display I already showed you. And you can see in black the original 3D printing times when everything is printed, and in green when fabrication is free. So the main thing we found out is that the more moving parts an object has, or parts that have to match some existing physical object, the slower the speed up will be. So in the following section, I show you a couple of more example objects to um, give you some examples for large speed up and small speed up. So here we fabricated a soap bar dispenser. And it consists of two parts. So the one that holds the soap and the other one that holds the razor blades for shaving off the soap. And as you can see here, the functional part of this object is actually this slab, so you can move the, the soap holder back and forth. So compared to the head-mounted display, the soap bar dispenser achieves a medium speed up since it has more moving parts that make up for a larger volume of the three more.
So using replication, we still achieve a speed up of a factor of three. So let me show you the worst possible case here. So this is a penny balister. It's very small, and the functional part, the set here, makes up almost all of the model. So when we now convert this uh, to Lego and 3D printed parts, a lot of the volume actually needs to be 3D printed. Therefore, we only achieve a speed up of around 1.5. So if you look at the chart again, as I already said, the more moving parts an object has, and the more parts have to fit some existing physical objects, the less speed up we can achieve. So let me show you one more example that we made for the Make magazine. And this mascot here is a little robot with a rotatable head and movable arms. And the cool thing about the robot is it has a large volume, but there are only very few parts that are actually moving. So we only printed the, the joints and we built the rest from Lego, saving more than 50 hours of printing time here, a factor of a speed up of 11. So let me show you how uh, fabrication works internally in implementation files. So after loading the model, fabricator Lego files it. And it Lego files it into Lego plates. Those are the very flat Legos to best approximate the 3D model. So to Lego file a model, uh, fabricator first calculates the bounding box, then extends the bounding box to a full, uh, full multiple of a one by one Lego plate, and afterward, fabricator fills the bounding box with Lego plates in those locations that overlap with the original model and the remaining locations are left empty. So you can see the result. After Legofication, fabricator still needs to optimize the brick layout. As you can see in the image, the Lego version so far consists of the one by one Lego plates, so those will of course fall apart. So fabricator's layout algorithm optimizes for two things. First, it tries to minimize the number of bricks so as to minimize assembly time. And then second, it also tries to maximize stability. So before layouting, users can define in a settings file which kind of bricks they have. And if they're really busy, they can also define how many they have. <laughs> then for layouting, uh, we build on a layout algorithm proposed by Tesos in a uh, recent Eurographics paper. And I will just quickly walk you through the algorithm. So it first starts by creating a random brick layout, as you can see here. Then it creates a connectivity graph of the current brick layout. And then based on a connectivity graph, it's very easy for the algorithm to identify parts that would fall off. The algorithm then just simply relay out that area and starts the connectivity check again, which then finally results in this uh, layout. The fabricator also needs to compute the bricks for 3D printing. So on the left side, you can see the bricks selected by the user, and on the right side, the part for 3D printing. So to generate these parts for 3D printing, we use a Boolean intersection of a Lego brick with the original model geometry, as you can see here. And this works because we use a simplified version of a Lego brick that is solid in size. So after the intersections, all faces are closed, there's no open face. In order to ensure a stable brick layout, we also need to identify incomplete knobs and holes on the 3D printed part. So as you can see here again, uh, with the forehead piece, some of the holes here are cut off. And that happens because during the Boolean intersection, I just showed you, it can happen that a part of the knob you know, is just sliced off from the intersection. So we detect this by using a special tagging approach. And after the intersection, the tags basically tell a fabricator if a part of the knob was outside after, uh, before the intersection and if the hole is no longer complete. And then for merging the bricks, we use the same tagging approach. So as you can see on the left side, when the user selects these separate Lego plates, the resulting part is one big piece. And for this, we use the merging. So fabricator simply tags each side of a Lego brick according to its orientation, and then for merging, we just simply find these neighbor sides and disable them. And finally, we just generate the SDL file for 3D printing by converting the internal geometry representation into SDL file format. So if you want to use our software, 
It runs in a browser, it's written in CoffeeScript, and we are very happy to share our code base, so if you're interested, just speak to me after the talk. Right, uh, let me sum this up. So in this talk, we showed you a system called Replicator. It limits a 3D printing to where it is actually necessary and uses bricks everywhere else. And Fabricator is the first implementation of a broader concept that we call low pi fabrication, which is the idea of using, um, of using fast low pi fidelity previews for all intermediate versions, and then at the very, very end, we basically print the complete model. And with this, I want to end my talk, and I'm very happy to answer your questions.